we started out, uh, you know, chapter one or session one uh, in the basics of uh, church membership. Uh, that's where we went up 10,000 miles high and we examined the connection between uh, the kingdom of God, the local church, and our salvation uh, in Jesus. And then the second week, uh, did you guys enjoy the, the history of Living Hope? And wasn't that awesome and amazing? I think when Living Hope started, I was like five years old. Um, today, it is the membership ceremony, but uh, for our purposes this morning, I've actually titled our, our lecture, and you have the handout, uh, The Heart of Church Membership. Okay, and so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but hopefully in, in 20, 40, no, okay, I, I got to dive right into it. Okay, so why don't I just pray for us and then um, we'll, we'll go in. Okay. Oh, Lord, I, I thank you so much for uh, my dear brothers and sisters here. And I know that um, today's the day where we're uh, going through church membership formally. And maybe there's different feelings and emotions. Uh, for some of us, we feel like, wow, um, what a long journey. I'm finally glad to be able to do this. Others of us, maybe we're even wondering, gosh, I hope I'm doing the right thing here. But God, what I do know is that I know that you love uh, your church. I know that you love uh, us in this room because of our profession of Jesus. Um, I know that you have a plan. Uh, for us and for this church. And so we want to lean into and walk into uh, what you have for us today uh, with faith. And so I, I really pray that today would be a joyous time and a joyous occasion. And um, I'm excited to see how you're going to use uh, every single person here for the advance of your kingdom, but also how you're going to use this church to strengthen and build up every single person here. And so I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, in a little bit, uh, I know uh, we, we have a long day today, so just get comfortable. Um, I know in a little bit we're going to head down there and uh, go through the uh, ceremony the first time during second service and then a second time during third service. And then we have the membership um, luncheon, uh, new members luncheon afterwards, and so it's a long day. But um, before we uh, kind of dive into all that, um, there's like this kind of heart personal address that I, I kind of wanted to give uh, for the last lecture. And um, here's... Uh, it's going to come in three sections, okay? But here, here's kind of the first thing. And this is really um, more of a pastoral heart. Um, if the first lecture was really brainy, if the second one was really uh, testimonial of kind of the, the uh, church's history, this one's really uh, kind of the bleeding heart lecture, okay? If I can put it in that term. Uh, but we'll start here. Uh, the church I choose to see. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've said this at every membership ceremony, uh, or, I'm sorry, interview that I've done, but our church is not perfect. <laughs> and some of us are smiling because you already know that to be true. And the longer that you're at a church, the more imperfections you, you, you see, right? Uh, and so the first section is, and here's really the big, the, the big point, the big idea for those of you uh, who want to fill in the blanks. No church is perfect, but, but God is perfecting his church. No church is perfect, God is perfecting his church. And the Christian, yeah, we confess both realities. However, we champion the latter. So we, we acknowledge both realities. We, we realize that uh, no church is perfect. Every church has its flaws. We also recognize that God is working on every church. And so we're not ignoring any reality. We affirm both. But where we really want to lean into and champion and celebrate, it's this idea that God is, he's not done with his church. Okay, so let me kind of uh, make that case um, through this hypothetical scenario, which we'll soon find out is not very hypothetical, okay? So here, here's the bio sketch of a hypothetical church, okay? So first, imagine that this church is, it's a divided church, okay? So pretend that there are factions of people who are different factions, and different factions are championing different leaders. So, you know, um, Certain factions are like, oh, we like this one pastor because, you know, we like his leadership. But then uh, another group of people in the church are like, no, well, I really like that pastor because he's funny and he, you know, he, he makes time for me. And there's all this kind of wrestling back and forth. And so they're a divided church. Secondly, they're immoral, right? So imagine that there is um, just some interesting relationships that are happening in this church and there's boundaries being crossed, okay? And then imagine that this church is, is polluted, and what I mean by polluted is, th that was fun. Uh, what I mean by polluted is, uh, this church is borrowing sinful ideas from outside of the church 
to try to resolve things within the church, okay? Uh, imagine that this church is self-driven. What I mean by that is uh, that individuals only care about their own freedom. They only care about their own expressions. And uh, this church is self-promoting, meaning individuals are, uh, it's all about individual reputation, uh, how I can make a name for myself. I want to build a platform here. I want to be known. Uh, so here, here's uh, the hypothetical. What, what, would you join this hypothetical church? Most of us probably would not join this church, right? Uh, in fact, we would call this a, a problem church, a problem church. We would not say this is hypothetical. We would say this is hypocritical, right? That's what we would say of the church. Um, the problem is, in a good way, that this is actually was not a hypothetical church. In fact, this was a church back in the first century. Uh, and um, here's what Paul the Apostle uh, called this church, okay? Uh, Paul considered this church, which this was the church of Corinth. Um, and he called this church, uh, he considered it a, prog a progressing church. A progressing church. So if, you, if you've ever read um, the first, first or second Corinthians, this was actually the the sketch of the Corinthian church. They were divided, they were immoral, they were polluted, they were self-driven, they were self-promoting. Uh, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, I mean, Paul's like, what is wrong with you guys? Do I have to go and show up? Like, what are you thinking? All these correctives. And yet, though while we would say, oh my gosh, like, I would never join the Corinthian church, Paul considered them a progressing church. Uh, here's what he, okay, I had to bring back this slide. Why? If we started with this slide, do you think we wouldn't end with this slide? Come on, guys. This is the, the face of church membership, okay? Uh, here's what uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. I, I really need to get rid of that slide. Uh, and I always say that, but I never do, okay? Here's what he says, okay? I'm going to read it for us really quickly. He says, um, this is the intro of 1 Corinthians. Uh, he writes, Paul, uh, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. Uh, and listen to what he says, okay? Like, because... Can, can we just be honest? Like, I, I, um, if I was addressing this church, I would not use the words that are flying out of Paul's mouth here. Okay, here's what he says. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Like, that is... Right, like you know, normally when you know when you read what Paul wrote, it, it sounds like someone who is um, they've been at the church for too long, right? And they don't know the realities of the church, right? They're always like, "It is wonderful to be here," right? And but they're totally oblivious to all the problems. Like that's what it sounds like. But Paul, we knew that he knew the uh, true realities of the Corinthian church. So what was he doing? Paul was more focused on God's faithfulness than the church's flaws. He knew the church's flaws, but what he was concerned with, what he concentrated upon was what God was doing, okay? And so we're going to see this broken down in three quick ways, all right? Here's the first thing. Um, Paul, first, was more focused on God's, oh, I'm sorry, Paul acknowledged God's faithfulness for their past forgiveness, for their past forgiveness or justification. That's just the fancy word for being declared right, uh, having right standing in relationship with God. Okay, so Paul acknowledges what God did for them in the past. Okay, here's what he says. Uh, he, he says, uh, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. So, you know that word sanctified? It, it's really, um, it means to be cut out. It's whole, to be made holy. Not because they were behaving holy, but because when they believed, uh, they were, their hearts, their lives were literally cut out from the world and attached to Jesus. And so he, he's acknowledging, look, when you believed, when, there was a time when God gave you faith and you exercised that faith. At that moment, you were cut out. You had relationship. You were forgiven. You were declared right with God. And so what Paul is doing is he's, a, he's affirming, he's pressing into, I, God forgave you in the past. Okay. Uh, the second thing that uh, he acknowledges uh, is that he acknowledges God's faithfulness for their future destination. 
Or uh, another fancy word for that is glorification. It's where we receive new bodies, where we're in heaven. Uh, we're, t- we're removed away from the presence of sin, Satan, and death. Um, we know this because towards the end, uh, he says, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you notice how he, he hopes for their future. Okay? And here's a third way that he focuses more on uh, God's faithfulness than their flaws. Paul was aware of God's faithfulness for their progressing transformation. So the fancy word is sanctification. That's where it's the earthly process of transformation where we become more like Jesus. Okay? And we know this because that's why he's writing to them. He's saying, hey, I, I want you to become like Christ. Why are you thinking like that? Why, why are you behaving that way? Okay? So here, here's the, the point that I've been hammering over and over and over again. Though aware of the church's imperfections, Paul just celebrated God's perfecting work. He celebrated God's perfecting work in their life. Okay? So no church is perfect. God is perfecting his church. The Christian confesses both realities. We just champion the latter. So uh, let me uh, just open up my heart a little bit and just share honestly, okay? Uh, I I don't know if you've ever had this feeling before where um, you think, um, have you ever, uh, like, what is wrong with that person? Have you ever had that idea in the church? Like, what is wrong with that person? Like they, like, they call themselves a Christian. Like, why are they acting? Like, they're so annoyed. They're so judgmental, right? Like, have you ever seen someone where you're just like, I'm so annoyed by that person? Now, that is probably true. <laughs> like, because a lot of our sharp assessments of people, it's, it's, you're just, you just know people. You know what people are like. You've just seen enough people. And so you can make a quick assessment. I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm just saying there are other realities that we need to press into which is what is God doing? How is God working in their life? And um, if I can just say this as a, uh, I'm still very young and cool and relevant, but when I was uh, even an even younger pastor uh, making a ton of mistakes, um, my my MO was I'd be so impatient, right? I'm like, I preached that a a month ago and you guys are still, come on, let's go, let's go. And uh, whenever, whenever I saw someone who wasn't doing something that I felt like they should be, or I would be that pastor who was like immediately like, Hey, like, let's talk. And I I would just do, try to do a corrective. What I've learned over time is now I just also just pray for that person and just wait. It's not, 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 uh, I'm not trying to be passive. But there's a, there's, there's a timeline. Like God is doing something in every season for every person's life. And what I've actually learned is God is much more effective at changing people's lives than me trying to force uh, a timeline. Amen? And so patience for one another, okay, for the church. I love what uh, John Stott, he's a, uh, a, a fa- uh, famous pastor, theologian, author. Here's what he said. It's a beautiful quote. <coughs> On earth... She, talking about the church, is often in rags and tatters, stained and ugly, despised and persecuted. But one day, she will be seen for what she is, nothing less than the bride of Christ, free from spots, wrinkles, or any other disfigurements, holy and without blemish, beautiful and glorious. It is to this constructive end that Christ has been working and is continuing to work. So we want to lean into this reality, all right? So that's the church that we must fight to choose to see. Which means, and this brings us uh, to our second point, and I know some of you who walked in late, this is kind of the final lecture. It's more of the bleeding heart lecture, okay? And so, um, but the second section is uh, the church member I choose to be. Uh, And this is kind of the implication then. If if the first uh, uh, statement, if we affirm that, this uh, is the big point and big uh, idea. The Christian, we fight for the church rather than against the church. We fight for the church rather than against the church. Now, okay, that does not mean that uh, we can't voice our opinion. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't complain. But can, can we just agree, there, there are different types of complaining too, right? Like, there's, uh, like I can complain in a way where uh, it's really for the betterment. Or I can just complain because I'm just really unhappy. Like, there, there's, there's a difference. Okay, and so there's three, again, three kind of ways that the, uh, we can kind of uh, live this out. One, we fight for a Christ-centered perspective regarding the church. 
Christ-centered perspective regarding the church. I don't know if you caught this, but in 1 Corinthians 1-2, uh, Paul is very adamant in the way that he addresses Corinth. He says, to the church of God. I, I never really caught that phrase. And then when I caught that phrase, I, I felt a little bit embarrassed and afraid. Um, just because sometimes the way that I think and talk about the church is so... Um, uh, it's like I'm talking about my, uh, like, like the garage. Oh, such a mess. Oh, someone's got to clean this up, right? But I love what Paul says. He's like, I know you're a mess. I know. But you're, you still belong to God. You, God has ownership of you. And so did you see that? Like Paul, who was insightful, he knew the problems of this church. Still, like the, the way that he wanted to view Corinth was, you still belong to God. So we have to wrestle that out, Okay. And, 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 you know, can I just say this? Um, again, Bleeding Heart uh, Lecture, right? If you ever feel like, oh, my gosh, like, do, do the leaders even know what's, what are the problems with some of the, you know? Yes, we do. We are aware. Uh, maybe not uh, down to certain uh, detail or detail, depending on where you're from, uh, but we, we were aware. And so, you know, like, I, I want you to know that. I think sometimes the people who have to wrestle and fight the most to have a, a Christ-centered perspective of the church is actually like, for example, like pastors and leaders because we, we see so much, right? But that's where we have to fight. This belongs to God. This is the Lord's. This is His church, all right? Uh, secondly, we uh, fight for Christ-driven affection for the church. Something we don't really talk about, but Christ-driven affection for the church. So <clears throat> this is... Um, this has haunted me. Uh, so Paul wrote many letters to Corinth. And I, 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 scholars believe that he, he may have written like four, but only two of them uh, were circulated and, and held to be you know, canonical in terms of it's in our Bible. But after he wrote the first uh, you know, Corinthians, which was more like corrective and almost blistering, he writes 2 Corinthians. Now, for the longest time, I never understood 2 Corinthians. I was like, why is he so emotional? Every year where I, I do more pastoral ministry, I love 2 Corinthians more and more. Uh, it's become a refuge and a shelter. Now, in Corinth, um, the problem is that they've rejected him because these so-called super apostles, they've walked into Corinth and they're like, hey, you know, like, why do you guys trust Paul? Like, can you, you know, he's not even a good speaker. And like, you know, like, man, like, don't trust him. He's not the real deal. So Paul plants Corinth and the very people backstab him. And they're like, we don't know if we can follow you. We don't know if you're the real deal. And here's what he says. He says, make room in your hearts for us. Okay. Um, we live in a day where it's like, a, oh, all right, fine. You know, like I'm not going to be invited to that, that uh, you know, social circle in the church. Well, that's fine. You know, I can find better people, right? Like that's, that's our MO. You have Paul, more, more educated, more spiritual, more godly, than anyone in, in Corinth. And his plea is, will you open up emotional space for us? For me? I know you've rejected me, but will you accept me again? Th th this is amazing. Look at the way he pleads. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have not taken advantage of no one. I, I do not say this to condemn you for I've said this, that you are in our hearts to die together. And to, so that's where the phrase, you know, we ride together, we die together. See, Paul said that first. Okay, that's where it comes from, okay? Um, you know, like, um, I, I've um, talked to uh, various Christians who, at, they've been in different seasons of church, sometimes very discouraged seasons of church. Um, I love it when a Christian, a member of our church can tell me, like, yeah, like, honestly, like, there was a time when I just wanted to leave. Or, like, I'm so discouraged. And it's okay. Like, we all have those seasons. Even leaders have those seasons. But that doesn't mean that we're not invited, we're not invited to, to fight in terms of our affections, to say, but these are my people. I will make room in my heart for these people, for that person. Okay, I know it's not easy. Lastly, we also fight for Christ-driven service towards the church, towards the church. So, uh, you know, Paul... Um, he writes in 2 Corinthians, he was like, we were under so much like, affliction, we thought we were going to die. 
And what he says in the intro is, but we realize that God made us suffer, allowed us to, so that with the very comfort that we've received, we can share it with you. And so here's, here's what he says. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience uh, when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope it, for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, all the bad things that we've experienced, how we're going to interpret it is that as we went through all that, it was just to make us, to help relate better with you guys, to understand you guys, to comfort you better, to walk with you better. So notice he goes through all this and his response isn't like, dude, where the heck were you? Like when we were suffering, when we were afflicted, did you pray for us? You know, did you, um, uh, did you like, you know, like us on Facebook and do all this? No, like that was not his heart. It was more like, because we went through these things, we can serve you better. That was Paul's heart. Okay. Uh, and so we fight for uh, Christ-driven uh, service. Okay. And so here's some practical steps. I, I, you guys have already looked at this uh, in, in terms of certain things, but uh, some practical steps. One, by investing in relationships. Uh, Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 2, bear, with, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, can I free everyone really quickly? Uh, when it says by investing in relationships, it doesn't mean everyone in the church, right? Um, I think I, I've heard someone say this like, oh, I feel overwhelmed because I can't get to know everyone. You shouldn't get to know everyone. It's impossible. You, you can't, like, it's impossible for us to get to know everyone just in this room. But we can get to know someone. Someone, right? Um, also, we can invest our time and talents, which is service. Uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, <laughs> those people, right? At the end of 1 Corinthians 15, 50, uh, 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immo immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that uh, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Just an encouragement. I know some of you guys are in much different seasons than, than other people. And so is there grace? And, you know, oh, absolutely. You know, I'm not going to walk around with a clipboard. Um, asking you, like, where have you been serving? I'm not going to do that. Pastor Steve's going to do that. No, 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 right? No, G's going to do that. No, um, of course not. Uh, but we can agree that it seems like the MO of the New Testament Christian is that they're, they're far more likely to serve than not serve, right? And it's for some of us, uh, we have more time. Others of us, we have more wisdom. And so depending on what God has given to us at different, you know, seasons of life, we can give in different ways, Okay. And by the way, it's okay to not be good at everything, right? Like I, I've tried to do, uh, I've tried to create sermon graphics. Don't do it. Leave that to the artists, right? Um, I, I thought um, I'm really good at leading small group. I'm terrible at small group. I just end up preaching for an hour, right? Uh, and so we all, we're all wired differently here. And, and so let's walk into that, okay? A uh, uh, third and final way, by investing our resources, tithing. Now, there's uh, some debate, right? Like in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, Israel was commanded to tithe, but with Jesus and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, that was the law. Do we tithe today? Uh, there's some debate, but let's just for the sake of argument say that New Testament Christians are not required to tithe. Let, let's just for the sake of argument go in that direction, okay? Um, that that still does not get to the heart of what God wants us to do with our money in terms of discipleship. So, so if, if our question is like, do we tithe? Do I tithe? Do I have to tithe? Does the Bible, like that, that's not the point. There, there's deeper issues, right? Uh, Jesus talked about money uh, and, and hell more than any other, right? Uh, writers in the New Testament. Uh, he aggressively talked about money. He even pulled up money out of a fish's mouth, which I've, I've still been trying to do uh, to this day. Uh, but Here's what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy. He, he says, this, as for the rich in this present age, which by the way, um, that's everyone in this room. I know many of us, we don't think we're rich, but if we're living in, if you have roof over your head, you have food, you have clothes, we're in pretty high percentage in the world. So as for us in this room, charge them not to be haughty or arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides with us everything to enjoy. Uh, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Why? The storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, the eternal future, 
so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So, you know, if, if, if we're like, you know, how much do I have to tithe? And is it, I don't know if it's commanded in the New Testament. And, and, but the point is, our money belongs to God anyways. And so the, at, at the core of it, the, the question isn't do I tithe? The question really is, what are we to do with his money, which he's given to us? How do we steward that? And so I'm just saying the church tithe may be one venue uh, to express that, where we can be rich with good works and to be generous, okay? So we fight for the church rather than against the church, rather than against the church. I, I've, I've done this, uh, addressed this in the membership interviews, but could there ever be a time where we lose so much confidence and trust in and, and people that we leave? Can we leave Living Hope? No, no, yeah, it, of course. Like God might call you like, through a unique set of circumstances, of course. I'm just saying there are good reasons to leave a church and there's really poor reasons to leave a church. Right? So if we're going to leave, then may we leave for a, a, a good reason and not a poor one. Okay? So we fight for the church rather than against the church. I love what Joshua Harris said. He said, if Jesus loves the church, you and I should too. We cannot use the excuse that the church has messed up too many times or that we're disillusioned. Jesus is the only person who has the right to disown and give up on the church, but he never has and he never will. That's what he said. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, he, he's, he's this famous preacher from a long time ago. He said this. He said, give yourself to the church. You that are members of the church have not found it perfect, and I hope that you almost feel glad that you have not. If I had never joined the church till I had found one that was perfect, I would have never joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I, I would have spoiled it. Do you get what he's saying? He's saying, I'm glad I never found the perfect church. If I did find it and joined it, I would have ruined it. Um, uh, for it would not have been a perfect church after I'd become a member of it. Still imperfect as it is. I love this. It is to us the dearest place on earth. The dearest place on earth. Okay. All right, finally, what's the living hope that God sees? Well, he sees our sinfulness. He sees our imperfections. He sees our flaws and weaknesses. He sees it all. But according to the New Testament, here's what um, God also sees. Living hope is the family of God and Father. <clears throat> Secondly, living hope is the bride and body of Jesus Christ. The bride and body of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, um, if you think about the imagery, those are very personal. We can agree, right? When, um, like, it, you know, uh, the first class I said, hey, why don't we all get up and, and um, you know, share our affinity group? Could you imagine if I said, hey, why don't we get up and just um, talk about our bodies a little bit? Like that, no, we would not be church members right now. Like no one, right? Like that's, it's very personal. Uh, and yet, this, that, that's a description, right? We're the, we're the body of Christ. Uh, third, living hope is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.22, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is how the Bible would describe a local church, household, family, body and bride, dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'll close with this quote, uh, and then uh, we're going to get some logistical information because we've got to head down for our uh, ceremony. Spurgeon said, the church is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who though they are saved are still sinners and need all the help they can derive from the sympathy and guidance of their fellow believers. The church is a nursery for God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow strong. It is the fold for Christ's sheep, the home for Christ's family. And so this is our church. You know, um, if I could close with this, uh, I heard a professor say once, that on the earth, church, doing church is like a bunch of porcupines who are in a tiny little room. We're, we're, we're just, just spikes, you know, just poking and hurting each other. That, that's what church is like on the earth. But he said when we get to glory and we're transformed, it's almost like a bunch of fluffy bunny rabbits uh, in a small space where we're, it's just so soft and nice. And, but in the meantime, uh, by the grace of God, uh, we're, we're marching forward. Church is messy. It is not sometimes clear or fun, uh, but we believe that in and through that, God is, God is working to change. Amen? Okay, I'll pray for us, and then James and G are going to give us some instructions. Uh, so let's pray. God, we uh, surrender ourselves to you. Uh, thank you for loving your church. Thank you that your church's uh, strength 
uh, you building the church is not just only dependent on how we feel. We're grateful that it's ultimately dependent on you. We love you. Help us to step into church membership the way that you desire for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.